صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لسان يفكه قولي الحمد لله رب العالمين ثم الصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين أما بعد فقد قال الله تعالى في كتابه المجيد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل لا أسألكم عليه أجرا إلا من شاء أن يتخذ إلى ربه سبيلا صدق الله العلي العظيم سلوة الله الحمد لله Your second salawat out of love up for Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. And your loudest salawat as condolences to the master of our time, Sahibul Asri wa Zabak. Respected Sayyid, elders, brothers and sisters. Aadhamullah ajuruna wa ajurakum bi musabin al ahlil bayt alayhim salam. My condolences to all of you as we are here to commemorate the loss and the difficulties that befell the family of Rasulullah, khususan his daughter, Fatima al-Zahra, salamullahi alayhi Over the next three nights, we're going to have a series of discussions, the first of which is to understand who is this personality of Fatima al-Zahra. Next, inshallah, tomorrow night we'll discuss uh, life lessons or how to live a successful life from Sayyidah Zahra and then finally what are the practical applications in today's life that we learn from the biography and from the behavior of Sayyidah Zahra but to understand why it's important that we look at this personality and we continue the process of commemorating remembering and understanding this personality we have to first try and see what was the purpose and the importance of this personality to be present within the religion of Islam. When we take a look and we see the message of our Holy Prophet, we see that when the people came to him and offered to him, Ya Rasulullah, you brought us hidayah, you brought us guidance, you gave us the key for the entrance to heaven. You taught us how it is that we should become members of heaven. Let us compensate you for your efforts. Let us give you something in return for it. The same way every Prophet who came before Rasulullah, his Ummah came to that Prophet and said to him, Ya Nabi Allah, you brought us hidayah, you gave us guidance. How can we compensate you for this? Now remember, someone who has faith in Allah and finds that from the darkness of this world, he has come to the conclusion to understand that he has a creator. What the purpose that he has been created for and how to connect to his creator, that's a wonderful thing. And when an ummah would realize that hidayah had reached them, that Allah had blessed them with the ability to connect to Allah, they would say, we want to thank the person who connected us to Allah. So they would come to every Nabi and they would say to every Nabi, let us compensate you. Can we give you something? Can we pay your bills? Can we give you things? Can we take care of you? And every Nabi would come and say, he says, I don't want any reward from you. Certainly my reward is with Allah, with the exception of this one Prophet, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Well, when the people came to him and they said to him, let us compensate you, you gave us hidayah. You gave us guidance. You taught us how to live a life with which Allah is pleased. You gave us direction in life. You gave us purpose. You gave us the key to eternal paradise. What can we do for you? How can we compensate you? And before Rasulullah answered, Allah answered. And in the famous ayah that we are all familiar with, we saw, قُلْ where he says, O oh Nabi, O oh Rasulullah, say to the people, Qul, la as'alukum alayhi ajran. I don't want from you any reward for this hidayah, for this message. Illa. Exception. Illa mawaddatan fil qurba. Except the love of my near ones. 
And this ayah is famous amongst us all, but there is another ayah which comes as well that was told to our Rasul, our Holy Prophet in Surah Al-Furqan where he's told, Qul, say to the people, لا أسألكم عليه أجرا إلا except من شاء أن يتخذ إلى ربه سبيلا except for the one who wants to take a connection or wants a connection to his Lord. Now you see, when we talk about proper language and context of language in this point, we'll explain to you why this structure is presented this way. When we talk about language, an exception can only be one clause. So for example, if I say, I don't drive any car except, what's a good car? Uh, a Tesla, right? These are nice these days. Except a Tesla. I won't drive any car except a Tesla. Then I go in front of another person and I say to him, I won't drive any car except a BMW. Well, let's keep it simple. Huh? We would say that this person doesn't know how to use language correctly. Because in an exception, you can only have one exclusion from it. If I've given two exceptions, then one of the two is invalid. It would say, Baba, which time are you telling the truth? Are you telling the truth now? that you won't drive any car except a BMW? Or were you telling the truth before that you won't drive any car except a Tesla? The person would say, well, it depends which car are you giving me right now. <laughs> but the reality of the structure of language works is that when you make an exception, there can only be one exclusory cause from, clause from that statement. You can't have two, otherwise you don't use language correctly. So now if when a human being makes an exception, for example, it's invalid for me to say two different things, but the way it can be valid is if I say the same thing in two different ways. I'll give you an example. I have never recited majlis in any center in Atlanta except the Ja'fari center. I have never recited the majlis in any center in Atlanta except the Mormon center. My Mormon family's here, right? Both of these mean the same thing. Therefore, I can make the exclusion that I can say either this statement or that statement and I am still correct in my lingual sense. Which is why when we take a look at the Quran, Allah is giving us a statement. He says that there is no reward or no act that is required in compensation for this message except to have love for the near ones of Rasulullah. And in the same sense, he's saying that there is no way that you can have a connection connection to Allah unless if it is through the near ones of uh, Rasulullah. The message he's conveying here is to say that the connection to Allah can only be the only thanks to Allah and the connection to Allah that you can have is through having love of Ahlul Bayt. If you have no love for Ahlul Bayt, you can't be connected to Allah. And if you want to be connected to Allah, it can't be without having love for Ahlul Bayt Salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. When we look at this idea of who are the near ones of Rasulullah, there can be many debates, but the one debate that can't, one personality that can't be debated is the daughter of Rasulullah herself. No matter who you are, this is agreed upon. So the question is, why did Allah declare the necessity for the love of this personality? Who is this personality? And we want to take a look at this personality in the light of her relationship with three sets of personalities. One is her relationship with Rasulullah himself. Two is her relationship with the Aima. And three, her relationship with us. And through these three relationships, we can understand why this personality is so significant in Islam that one should never separate from her in any moment that they have. They should seek her intercession and her connection. When we take a look and we begin in our three discussions, we start with the most important one, which is the connection to Rasulullah, where our Holy Prophet Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Where he himself says that Fatima bad'atum minni. That Fatima is a part of me. Before we even continue the rest of the narration. When we look at, for example, the personality of Rasulullah. We say he is the leader of all of the Anbiya. 
He is rahmatun lil alameen. He is Habib Allah. That if all of the prophets were put in one place, their objective from Adam ila karib ila khatim was to introduce and prepare the people for the message of our Holy Prophet. That look how different Allah changed the world by the coming of our Prophet. That he says, once I put my rahmatul lil alameen on this world, I held off my azab and my punishment from the people until the day of judgment. No other prophet has this characteristic or this honor. No other prophet is known as the leader and the king of all of the other anbiya, except this Rasulullah. And he's making the statement that if you want to connect to me, if you want to have a relationship with me, this Fatima is a piece of me. And then he continues, he says, That Allah is pleased when she is pleased, and Allah is displeased when she is displeased. That Rasulullah is showing that whatever my status with Allah is, that is the status of this Fatima. That when I have a connection to her, understand that my connection to her is the same as the connection of Allah. This is why the question came from some of the companions and the wives of Rasulullah, that when Fatima would enter the house, they would see the Prophet stand up from his seat, Kiss Fatima and seat her in his place. And the question came, Rasulullah, Fatima is no longer a child. She's a grown woman. Don't you exceed the bounds of showing her respect? And there's two ways to continue this. We're going to continue one way today and tomorrow will be the other half of this conversation. When we look at the life of Rasulullah, we take Sunnah of Rasulullah. We take the Sunnah of Rasulullah. Had this been from a normal action, it would have made obligatory on every father that when his daughter enters the room, he stands up for her. If we look at Rasulullah as simply a father, Sunnah of the Holy Prophet is when my daughter enters the room, I stand up. And I seat her in my place. But we saw there's no one who's ever said this is Sunnah of Rasulullah. Because this wasn't considered the action of a father for his daughter. This was considered the istiqbal of Nabuwat for the personality of Fatima to Zahra. That it wasn't the fact that it was only the daughter, it was the fact that this was Fatima herself that made the action of Nabuwa to demonstrate that this Fatima is connected to the Nabuwa and not separate from it. To understand what that status was, otherwise it would have been on all of us that when a daughter enters the room, we all stand up. But it's not showing that this is for any daughter. This is the khususiyat for Fatima that she was something unique and special, that she was a part of the Nabuwa, that Khatimul Anbiya stands up for Fatima. And if Khatimul Anbiya stands up for Fatima, do you think all of the other Anbiya won't stand up for Fatima? It shows you the status. And another aspect, we take a look, we see Allah in the Quran, He says, when through Nabi Ibrahim is the dua, Rabbi hablana azwajna wa dhuriyatna qurrata a'ayun wa ja'alna lil muttaqina imama. That this is one of the duas that, oh Allah, make for us from our spouses and our children qurrata a'ayun, the coolness of our eyes. And when we talk about, for example, in Du'a'i Tawassul, the personality of Sayyidah Zahra, what do we call her? We say, Ya Fatima bint Rasulullah, Qurrat Ain al-Rasul. That this was the coolness of the eyes of Rasulullah. When Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, was asked about this characteristic. He says, I have never prayed to Allah for my children to have beautiful faces. I have never prayed to Allah for my children to have to 
to have upright characters are tall statures in society. Based on the Arabic of the language, it could be seen that they should be tall or it should be that they have upright character. He says, I never asked Allah for anything of these sorts, but what I asked him is that when my child, I look at him, I see a child who fears Allah. I see a child who wants to fulfill the demands of Allah from him, and at that moment, I consider that child to be qurrat ain, the coolness of my eye. That Rasulullah is demonstrating that when I say Fatima is part of me, when I say Fatima is a part of Nabuwat, she is also the completion in Nabuwat because of all of the characteristics she possesses that Allah wants to see in a child. She possesses all of the characteristics that are demanded to be seen in a father's daughter. Let's say the Zahra has these unique characteristics and qualities that tie her to the Prophet unlike anyone else, which is also shown in one other aspect of her title known as Muhaddatha. When we talk about al kab of Sayyidah Zahra, that within itself is a complete discussion. But one of her titles is Muhaddatha. Muhaddatha refers to one to whom the Malaika speak. You see, there's a difference between Anbiya and A'imma. A Nabi, the Malaika speak to him, A'imma, and A Nabi has a connection, a direct connection with the Malaika, with the angels. A'imma alayhim salam they receive knowledge from Allah, but not through the Malaika. They don't have the ability to interact with the Malaika freely. Sayyidah Zahra was somebody who was unique because she was someone who did have communication with the Malaika. When we take a look and we see that there is something known as Sahifa Fatima, the book of Fatima. This book of Fatima is a book that was revealed to Sayyidah Zahra herself alone. And we see in the narrations when someone asked our sixth Imam, Imam Ja'far ibn Muhammad as Sadiq alayhi salam, Muhammad. He explained, he says, the book of Fatima is three times the length of the Quran and yet it does not include even one word from the Quran. He says, after the shahadat of Rasulullah, when Sayyidah Zahra was in a state of grief, Allah sent Jibra'il to reveal to Fatima and to keep her occupied with this wahi in her state of sadness. And in this book, Allah revealed to Sayyidah Zahra everything that happened in this world and everything that will happen in this world from the first day until the end. And this is one of the unique miracles of Sayyidah Zahra that the Malaika and Jibra'il spoke and brought wahi to her the same way they brought it to the Anbiya. Which is another reason why we understand the statement Fatima Bad'atum minni. That if the Malaika are speaking to Rasulullah, they are speaking to Sayyidah Zahra as well too. When we talk about, for example, the alamat of the coming of the Imam of our time, Ajjalallahu ta'ala farajahu we talk about the idea of recognizing his characteristics and how will we build a connection with this Imam and how will we know this Imam and we know that in the end of times there will be many people who will come and make claims of various sorts to try and speak on the authority of the Imam but Allah has given certain signs that are unique to the Imam and they are signs for us that we can authenticate and verify that truly the personality with whom we are speaking is the Imam. And one of these signs and one of these items is this Sahifa Fatima. That when the Imam comes, this will be one of the mu'jizat in his, in his treasures. And when we want to know and authenticate, is this the Imam? This will be one of the many signs that we can ask and see with the Imam to know he is telling the truth. From amongst the others is also the Quran that was written by Amir al Mu'minin, the Dhul Fiqar, the armor of Rasulullah. These are all mu'jizat that our Imam will possess to show to us and authenticate for us that no one can misguide us or mislead us in his presence that he is truly the Imam. And may Allah hasten his reappearance, inshaAllah. Which brings us to our second discussion, the relationship of Sayyidah Zahra with the Imams. This is a very interesting topic and before I explain this topic to you, there's an important hadith that I have to narrate to you because if I don't narrate this hadith, 
you won't appreciate the riwayah that I'm going to share with you. It starts and it's narrated in Bisharat uh, al-Mustafa li Shi'at al-Murtada and a number of other books that are about the authentication, the characteristics of the Shia and of Amir al-Mu'mineen to teach us who the Ahlul Bayt are and what their relationship to us is. And the narration begins with a conversation between Asbar, Asbar ibn Nubata, who was a companion of Amir al-Mu'mineen, who enters into the market and goes to visit Maytham al-Tammar. When he goes to visit Maytham al-Tammar, and I'm sharing stories so the kids stay listening, huh? stay focused. If you fall asleep, I'm going to pick on you, okay? Asbar goes, goes to Maytham al-Tammar, and he says, Maytham, I heard a hadith today that is troubling for me. I heard something from Imam Ali today that is too difficult for me to handle. Maytham says, what did you hear? What could be so bad? What's so difficult that you heard from Imam Ali that you, Asbah, who is a close companion of Amir al-Mu'mineen, become worried? Asbah says, I was sitting with our master and he said to me that our hadith, the Ahlul Bayt, the hadith of the Ahlul Bayt, are so weighty and heavy that no one can understand them except the high-ranking angels, the Anbiya, and those few Mu'mineen whose hearts have been tested. Asbach says, I couldn't take it, that was too much for me. Why was it too much? I'll tell you, you don't have to tell me, I'll tell you. There's two reasons why it could have been too much. One is to say is that we who love the Ahlul Bayt believe the love of the Ahlul Bayt is something natural. It should be something that anyone who hears it should recognize the love of Ali Muhammad and want to come to them. And here the Imam is telling you that our traditions are something that not anyone normal can handle. How then will the people come to Ali Muhammad? How will the people come to know the children of Rasulullah? How will they come to know the path of Hidayah if the word of Ali Muhammad is too difficult for them to understand? Maybe this is the reason why. The other reason why it could be that Asbagh says this hadith was too heavy for me was that maybe the implication was that Asbagh is saying that even I am not worthy to understand the words of Ali Muhammad. Same way as you and I, we see ourselves as normal people. Amir al muminin is saying the only ones who can understand our word are the high-ranking angels, the Anbiya, and those chosen servants whose hearts have been tested. Maytham, hearing this, becomes worried. He says, I don't know what to do with this. So he says, Asbagh, leave it. Let me go to Imam Ali and I will ask him. You have to remember, there are certain companions who came to Ahlul Bayt and came to Amir al muminin searching for knowledge and the Imam would give them something. And then there were other companions of Ahlul Bayt who the Ahlul Bayt used to say, come with me, I have something I need to teach you. Like Maytham, like Kumail ibn Ziyad. Look at Kumail. Amir al muminin takes him and teaches him this dua of Kumail that we recite on Thursday nights. He says, Kumail, you need to remember this and pass this on. Imam Rada alayhi salam explains this dua. Salawat ala Muhammad. Allah. He says the dua of Kumail that Amir al muminin took Kumail and taught him is such a thing that I recommend that the Mu'mineen recite at least every day. If they can't recite it every day, recite it once a week. If they can't recite it once a week, recite it once a month. If not once a month, once every three months, once every six months, once a year. I tell you, Imam Rada is saying, for the mu'mineen, how powerful this dua is. Make sure that your life does not pass except that you have recited this dua at least once in your life. And the benefits you will get from reciting it at least once in your life is something you can't compare with. How powerful this dua is. Amir al muminin takes Kumail by the hand and says, you have to learn this dua. Maytham was like that companion. And Maytham says, if there is such a gap in this knowledge, how will the people benefit? How will I benefit? Maytham is someone who used to know the secrets of the future, who knew what to see, what was coming in the future because of what Amir al muminin taught him. So Maytham goes to Imam Ali alayhi salam, he sits with him, he says, Ya Amir al muminin Asbagh has narrated a hadith for me that is too heavy. I don't understand it. Explain it to me. 
Amir al-Mu'mineen says, what is that hadith? So Maytham reiterates that our hadith, that you said to Asbagh, our hadith are so weighty that no one can understand them except for the chosen angels, the high angels, the anbiya, and the select few amongst the slaves. Amir al-Mu'mineen says, oh Maytham, I will make it more difficult for you. He says, Maytham, when Allah said, قَالَ رَبُّكَ إِنِّي جَاعِلٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ خَلِيفَةً that when Allah told the angels, I am going to put my Khalifa on this earth, the Malaika said, أَتَجْعَلُ فِيهَا مَنْ يُفْسِدُ وَيُسْفِكُ الدِّمَاعَ Are you going to put someone on this earth as your Khalifa who will cause fasad and fighting and strife and spill blood? And we, the Malaika, are here worshipping you and you're going to put somebody like that, a human being, on this earth? Amir al-Mu'mineen says, Maytham. Were the Malaika able to understand the saying of Allah at that point in time? Meaning Amir al-Mu'mineen is saying, Maytham, you think that the Malaika can understand the words of Ahlul Bayt? Even the Malaika don't understand the words of Ahlul Bayt. Because Allah, what does he say? Inni a'alamu ma la ta'alamun. I know that which you do not know. He tells the Malaika, you don't know what I know. My knowledge is something secret that I have reserved in a special place that even the angels couldn't understand it. Maytham, understand something. The knowledge of something of Allah is something so reserved that when Allah gave Musa the Torah, Musa thought that he knew everything that when people said, are you the most knowledgeable on this earth? Musa said, yes, I am. So Allah sent him Khizr to show Musa that Musa, even you don't know what's on this earth. That Musa with all of his knowledge couldn't appreciate the knowledge that Khizr had. So he says, Maytham, then how do you imagine that on the day of Ghadir, when Rasulullah took my hand and lifted me and said, Man kuntum mawla, fahadha aliyun mawla. How did you imagine then, if those people couldn't appreciate the knowledge of Allah, how did you imagine then common people would have the ability to appreciate my position and my status with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he's saying to him, he says that if you can understand and appreciate the status of us, the Ahlul Bayt, this is a gift from Allah to you. Not everybody has the capacity to appreciate this. Allah showed throughout the creation of Adam that people can't appreciate his knowledge except whom Allah pleases to give it. At one time, the angels couldn't appreciate the knowledge of making Adam the Khalifa on this earth. At one time, Musa who received the book of Allah couldn't appreciate that there were more knowledgeable people on this earth than himself. And the same way, oh, us, oh Maytham. People on this earth cannot appreciate the knowledge with which Allah has bestowed us unless if Allah blesses them with our love of our wilaya. So he says, Maytham, this is a moment for you to be thankful. Which is why. Now let me explain to you the relationship of Sayyidah Fatima with the A'imma and understand something. If you don't understand the riwayah right away, don't throw it out. Wait that may Allah bless you with its understanding. Rasulullah in Mi'raj. Allah says to Rasulullah, لَوْلَا خَلَقْتُكُمْ مَا خَلَقْتُ الْقَوْمِ Oh my beloved, oh Habib Allah, if I would not have created you, I would not have created the earth. And he continues, he says, Lo la khalakta, Ali, ma khalaktukum. He says, and if I had not created Ali, Ya Rasulullah, I would not have created you. <laughs> then he continues, Lo la khalaktu Fatima, ma khalaktukuma. If I would not have created Fatima, I would not have created either of you. Now, some people when they hear this narration, because they are not capable of understanding this, they say, Kufr, shirk, throw it away. No. You have to understand what was the purpose of the message. What is Allah teaching you and I about the status of this Fatima? 
when he makes the statement that he says, had I not created you, Rasulullah, I would not have created this world. Agree? Yes? Why? Because the world needs the mercy of Allah on this earth. And if there was no source of connection to Allah through the complete mercy, there would be no point in creating the world because they could never reach Allah. So therefore, if there is no rahmatul lil alameen, if there is no mercy for all of humanity, there's no point in humanity because humanity can never reach Allah. So Allah says, had I not created you rahmatul lil alameen, there would have no benefit for this world because they could never reach me without you. Next statement. Lola Ali ma khalaqtukum. Had it not been for Ali, Ya Rasulullah, I would not have created you. Why? Because Rasulullah was created as a human being. A human being has a lifespan. He is born and he dies. Yani, as long as this world exists, any human being within it must pass away, must die. Kullu nafsin, dhaikatul maut. So Allah is saying, I sent rahmatul lil alameen. I gave guidance to humanity. But if there was no way for that guidance to continue after your shahadat, Ya Rasulullah, there would be no point for you to go through all of these troubles because the message would have ended with you and humanity would be absent from that guidance. Therefore, I gave you a wali. I gave you a khalifa. I gave you a successor. So that, Ya Rasulullah, when you leave this world, your message continues and there is someone here to teach that message that you brought to this world. So he made the statement, Lawla Ali, ma khalaktukum. That if it was not for a way, Ya Rasulullah, for your message to continue to benefit humanity through the wali, through the khalifa that I made Ali ibn Abi Talib, I would not have troubled you with taking care of this world because the message would have ended with you. Once you left this world, it would have disappeared on this earth. So then the next statement comes. And if I had not created Fatima, I would not have created either of you. Why? Because through Fatima come all of the other a'imma who are the authority of Allah on this earth until the day of judgment who will be here to protect and teach and lead the world with the message of Rasulullah until the day of judgment. Had there not been a personality like Fatima who was pure and clean and the spring from which the Tahira spring from which the Aimma come, there would have been no way for the message of Rasulullah to stay on this earth until the day of judgment and there would have been no point in Ali protecting the message or Rasulullah bringing the message because it would not have stayed with humanity on this earth after that. Therefore we understand when Allah makes the statement that I would not have created either of you had it not been for Fatima, it's because through the children of Fatima the message of Allah is protected till the day of judgment. Salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. And this is encapsulated in the hadith of the Imam perfectly. نَحْنُ حُجَّةُ اللَّهِ عَلَى الْأَرَضِ وَفَاطِمَا حُجَّةَ عَلَيْنَا That we are the authority of Allah on this earth and our mother Fatima is the authority over us. When we look at the position of an Imam, an Imam is someone who guides humanity, but the Imam's isma, his ma'sumiyat, his ability to guide, his purity, his sinlessness, that we rely on to listen to the word of the Imam and know that it is haq, is based on the position of him being the son and the connected personality to Bibi Fatima That if there are a'imma, their authority comes from the status of Sayyidah Zahra. And that's why all of the Imams are from the children of Sayyidah Zahra and nowhere else. So we see that if you want to have ma'rifah, every quality you see in an Imam, the masdar, the source, the spring for it comes from Bibi Fatima. That there is no goodness in an Imam except that it is through the connection to Rasulullah through Bibi Fatima. That when we take a look and we see that uh, our Holy Prophet Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, 
He says, I and Ali were put in the backbone of Adam. Our nur was together from Adam until our grandfather, Abdul Muttalib. Then it split. My nur and the nur of Nabuwat went to my father, Abdullah. The nur of Wilaya in Khilafat went to Abu Talib. And in these two, the nur of Imamat and Nabuwat was separated until Allah sent Fatima and she rejoined and united again the nur of Nabuwat and the nur of Wilayat and from her came the children. Now understand, when you read Hadith Kisa and in it when Jibra'il asks, who is it that is under this Kisa? Who is it that is under this Chadar? Who is it that's under this sheet? Allah gives the description, He says, هم فاطمة وأبوها وبعلها وبنوها سلامات الله. Never underestimate or imagine that we can encapsulate the fadail of Bibi Fatima. That purity, that spring that she is, is unlike anything else. That even Allah is directing you to pay attention. When I put the phrase in this structure that I connect everything through Fatima, it's not an accident. It's not only for the beauty of language. There is a purpose why Fatima is there. That she is the connector that brings forward the Aimma. And next comes the question that through the Aimma, how do we connect to Bibi Fatima? What are her fada'il relating to us? First and foremost, our Prophet explained, he says, we, Allah named Fatima, Fatima, لِأَنَّهَا Fatima عَنِ النَّارِ That Fatima means the one who separates, and Allah named her Fatima, because she will be the one who separates the mu'mineen from the fire of hell. That alone should be the reason that you connect to Bibi Fatima, is that because of the wasila of her name, that one is who connected to her is separated from the fire of hell. Imagine, just that. But there are other narrations that show this as well too. For example, when we look at the marriage of Sayyidah Zahra, there's a narration that's na mentioned that says that when the time for the marriage of Bibi Fatima came, she asked her father, Ya Abata, oh father, what did you set as my mahar? What was my dowry that you have set? And it's a very famous that her dowry was a very simple amount of, in some narrations, 500 dirham, in some narrations, 480 dirham, a very nominal amount. And some of the items of the household that were to be put in her house, this was her dowry. And this one narration in Basayr al-Darajat, it says, Sayyidah Zahra turned to her father and she said, Oh father, this is the dowry of a normal woman. Any normal woman can have a dowry like this. I don't want a dowry like this. My intended is from the house of Allah. The one who I'm going to marry is from the house of Allah. If I am to have a dowry, I want to have my dowry from the owner of the house. That my dowry, my mahar, should come from the keeper of the house. So Rasulullah says, Fatima, what will you ask of your dowry then? Fatima says that I want to have the right of the intercession for your Shia, Ya Rasulullah. That ask Allah that if I am to marry into the one who came into his house, then I wish to have the right for intercession on the day of judgment. Then understand something that Sayyidah Zahra takes her dowry with the interest of the Ummah of Rasulullah to be able to intercede for them, for the Shia of Rasulullah. It's not a normal status that this is someone who we should be connecting through then. And this is how we take a look and we see that Sayyidah Zahra was someone who was for us a signal through which we can recognize Haqq. That the true religion of Islam is connected through this personality because of the efforts that she took to make sure that she anyone who has the love for her has the right of her intercession. How? Let me show you a practical example. Allama Amini, who is sahib kitab -e ghadir kitab -e ghadir is one of the great books of explaining the differences and the haqq from the batil in the religion of Islam. When he wrote his book Al-Ghadir, after that he went to Hajj. When he went to Hajj and he came to Medina, the, the teachers of Medina looked for an opportunity to get him into a munazira and prove him wrong. Said his book is 10 volumes. 
We're never going to get through the book. Let's just have it out with him here. So they called him, and he refused to come. He refused to come. They kept saying, come, let's sit, we'll talk, we'll just have tea. Eventually they said, come and have lunch with us, and we promise you we will not debate with you or argue with you about anything. He says, you promise? They said, yes, we promise. We won't argue with you about anything. We will not say anything to you. Just come and have lunch with us. Alam Amin, he says, okay, fine. He goes to lunch, they serve lunch, they eat lunch, and at the end of the lunch, all of the scholars who are sitting there who want a shot at Alam Amin, they say, why don't we go around the sufra and we'll each share a hadith that we really like. And Alam Amin, he says, there you go. Now they're going to pick a fight with me. So sure enough, they went around and qala Abu Huraira, qal fulan ibn fulan, qal fulan ibn fulan. They went around until eventually they got to Alama Amini. And Alama Amini says, I refuse to speak. He said, no, no, you have to. Everybody shared a hadith. Why don't you share a hadith with us? So Alama Amini says, I will share a hadith with you on one condition. He said, what's that condition? That after it, I can ask you a question. Great, let's do it. So Alam Amini says, قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ مَنْ مَاتَ وَلَمْ يَعْرِفْ إِمَامِ زَمَانِهِ مَاتَ مِيتَةً جَاهِلِيَةً This is a narration of Rasulullah that is accepted amongst every school, every person. This is one of the most basic fundamental ahadith. Everybody accepts it. And in it, Rasulullah says, one who dies and does not know the imam of his time, dies the death as if he died in jahiliyyah before Islam. He never had Islam. And they say, good hadith, nice hadith, we like that hadith, it's a good hadith. He says, you all like it? He says, they say, yeah, yeah, we love this hadith, good hadith. So he says, here's my question for you. Who was the imam of Fatima to Zahra when she died? One question he asked, this is why. Say, the Zahra to us is the litmus that separates haq from batil. Because in that instant, every cleric turned away his face and walked up and got out of the room. Why? Because they knew when Sayyida Zahra died, she says, I am angry with these two. Oh Allah, bear witness, I am angry with these two. So does that mean that Sayyida Fatima, if these were Imamul Haq, that Sayyida Fatima did not know the Imam of her time? The daughter of Rasulullah did not know what the imam of her time was. No one had an answer for this statement and they all got up and walked out of the room. Why? The status of Sayyidah Zahra is something that teaches us why and who Haq is with. Which is why when we take a look at the story of Fadak, understand something. Look at history. Sayyidah Zahra, after shahadat of Rasulullah, stands up and demands the right of Fadak. But after that, did you ever see any Imam go and demand the right of Fadak? Amir al muminin takes the Khilafah. Four years and nine months he has Khilafah. Does he ask for Fadak? Did any Imam that we know of ever do and go out and search for the right of Fadak? No. Because the purpose of searching for Fadak was not Fadak, was the bringing back of the wilayat of Ali ibn Abi Talib Let me explain to you how I make that connection. First off, amongst the Ahlul Sunnah, there's conversations amongst their ulama where they sit and they say that Fadak was a property, if she wanted it, why didn't they give it to her? And they say because if they gave her Fadak, then tomorrow they would have to give Ali back the Khilafat. That this would mean if it was okay for Rasulullah to leave a wasiyah about a piece of property, then he must have left a wasiyah about the khilafat of the state of the Muslimin. Look even further. Why did Sayyidah Fatima bring this up? Now imagine something. That if Sayyidah Fatima had gone out and instead of asking for Fadak, she had asked for the khilafat of Amir al muminin they would say Fatima is being political after the rights of her husband. Fatima has an interest now that her husband has the Khilafat because it will improve the quality of her life. We would have seen Sayyida Fatima in the pages of history polarized to being a political figure that was a ploy by her spouse to go and look for his power. But when we see Sayyida Fatima stand up in history and demand her right and demand what was her haq, 
No one can deny that she had any ulterior, or no one can say she had ulterior motive. All they can say is that it was her right that she wanted, and they should have given it to her. But once they would have given her the right, they would have acknowledged that there were other rights that they also denied as well. Fadak in history, the purpose of Fadak was not that that was the source of income for the family of Rasulullah. If the family of Rasulullah are personalities, if they are personalities who the Quran acknowledges when they fast for three days and they're hungry, they'll give away their food and open their fast with water and say, We don't want any wealth from you. Do you think then Sayyidah Fatima is a personality who is worried about where her wealth would come from? No. She wanted to show society that our rights have been usurped. But if I came to you for the Khilafat, you would say I'm being political. You would say I'm being used. So I came to you for that which is mine to show you that this dhulm that you are doing is with the interest of separating us from our rights. Which is why, if we can appreciate what is fadak in history, we can appreciate that the right was stolen, we can acknowledge and recognize haq from batil. We can recognize where haq was and where batil was. And this is why Sayyidah Fatima for us, her fadail are not just in these narrations, but her fadail are even in the patience with which she bore her difficulty. When she says the statement and she says, Oh Father, after you left me, difficulties were poured on me in such a way that had they been poured on days, those days would have been turned into nights. As is the haqq, if we can turn off the lights to recite the masaib of Sayyidah Zahra, is that possible? Is that something we can do? That we should, those masaib that she is telling us were put on her in such a way that if they were put on days, they would turn into night. Ya Sayyidah, tonight we'll mention a few of those masaib. When we talk about the event of the door of Sayyidah Zahra, understand something. This happened only a few days after her father left this world. And it didn't happen once, it happened at least three times if not more. And it wasn't that one man came to the door, Hujum ala bayt Fatima. Hundreds came to the door to frighten the daughter of Rasulullah. In one narration it says, the first when they came, that the companions had gathered within the house and when they heard them threatening the children of Rasulullah, Zubair came out of the house and raised his sword. You speak to Bada'atul Rasulullah this way. You speak to the grandchildren of Rasulullah this way. One threw a stone, knocked the sword from the hands of Zubair. They captured Zubair and they said, come out or we will kill him. Sayyidah Zahra says, there will be fighting in my house. All of you companions leave my house. They all left her house. Again, they found that Zahra and Amir al-Mu'mineen were looking for people who would support the right of Amir al-Mu'mineen. So they said, go now and silence her. Take as many men as you can. And when they came to the door, if Ali ibn Abi Talib had been behind the door, it would have raised their anger more that he is behind the door, pull him out. So the Zahra came to the door and she says, have you no respect for the door of the daughter of Rasulullah? The Mal'oon became silenced. He went back and he reported back. He said that there is Fatima in this house. What shall we do? And they said, you, fear, you, 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 you cowards, you fear from her. I will deal with Fatima directly. And the third time they came, they came with firewood and they came and they yelled that, oh Fatima, come out. Oh Ali, come out. And again, Sayyidah Zahra went to the door that maybe it would be that the people would realize that this is the daughter of Rasulullah they are abusing. That maybe by acknowledging that this was the one that Rasulullah used to stand up and kiss, that this was the one that Rasulullah would sit in his place, the people would have some shame in their eyes and they would leave the house of Zahra. But when Sayyidah Zahra said, we don't come out, he said, pile the firewood in front of her door. We will burn this house and all who are in it. 
And they said, even if the daughter of Rasulullah is in this house. And he replied, wa in. And so what? And in this condition, they say that they came and they lit the fire at the door. I will recite for you this in a way that even my heart cannot accept. But remember something. The Messiah of Sayyidah Zahra is something so heavy that Imam Sadiq's body would burn with a fever. They would say, Wait, what is this fever? He would pour cold water over his head and call out, Ya Zahra, what did they do to my mother Zahra? Imam al-Jawad as a child of five would cry bitterly in the streets when Imam Radha asked him, Oh my son, what made you cry? He says, How did they abuse my mother Zahra in her house? Oh father, if I could, I would remove them from their graves and burn their bodies. Listen to what happened. They brought the firewood. Sayyidah Zahra put out her hand and said, I am Zahra, the daughter of Rasulullah. Dare you burn my house? Mal'oon took a whip from Kunfud. They said he whipped the hand of Zahra so hard that Amir al-Mu'mineen would narrate. The arm of Zahra had black bruises on her hand until the day she died from how severely she was whipped. They lit the fire at the door. Sayyidah Zahra called out, this is the house of Rasulullah. They pushed the door. Zahra was behind the door. They described, they pushed the door. Zahra was squeezed between the door. They said there were over 300 men outside. Had they not been there, you would have heard a sound similar to the sound of glass breaking. When they were asked, what would this sound of glass breaking would be? They said, these were the ribs of Fatima. In this way, Sayyidah Zahra was pressed behind the door. They pushed the door, the door broke. They dropped the door on Zahra. The narrations continue. They said Sayyidah Zahra was between the floor and the door. A mal'oon came, put his foot upon the door, pressed upon the daughter of Rasulullah, and then she called out, Fidda, come to my aid, my muhsin has been martyred. <laughs> in tarikh there are two things in poets they have said there are two things that wept at the mazlumiyat of the masum one that we see that the poet had no way of describing it except to say that even the asha the items wept for the ma masum one is the dhulfiqar in the hands of imam hussein on the day of ashura they said when Imam Hussein went and dug the grave of Asghar in the field of Karbala, he was so mazloom and oppressed that Dhulfiqar wept over that zulm. And when Imam Hussein, the poet says, why Dhulfiqar do you weep? Dhulfiqar would reply, I was created for the defense of the religion of Islam, not for digging the graves of the children of Rasulullah. The other item that they say the personality was so mazloom that the uh, objects swept over them were the earrings in the ears of Fatima to Zahra on that day. They said they struck the face of Fatima so severely that even her earrings broke from her ears and fell to the ground. They said we imagined those earrings would weep. That these were the cheeks that Rasulullah used to kiss. These were the cheeks in the face the malaika would come for ziyara. Today you have struck this innocent masoom so severely. Even we have been broken in the assault on Zahra. They continue. Some of the... Some of the, the injuries that say the Zahra suffers are not even found out at this time. They are found out later at her burial that we will mention another day. They say that in this instance, Amir al-Mu'mineen came running to the door. He came from inside the house and he took the Mal'oon who attacked Zahra, threw him upon his face and said, had it not been for the patience with, with which with Rasulullah commanded me, I would have killed you at this moment. They said it was because of this patience that we knew Ali ibn Abi Talib would have, that when it was said, how should we take Ali from the house? They said, take him from the house in the worst of manners. So what they did was they took a rope and they tied it and put it around the neck of Ali and started to drag him through the streets of Medina. Fatima loving Amir al-Mu'mineen, though she has 
lost Mohsin, though she has suffered such, comes after her husband Amir al-Mu'mileen in the streets of Medina. As she comes out, her crying again causes people to be stirred to recognize that these are the children of Rasulullah. That they said we must silence Fatima. So now Fatima is being struck by a whip again in the market of Medina. They said they struck Fatima so hard that eventually Fatima called out, I am not asking you to let Ali go. I am asking you to stop beating me in the streets of my father's city. They took Amir al-Mu'mineen to the court and Sayyidah Zahra followed behind. They said that in this moment Sayyidah Zahra raised her hands in dua in such a way that all of the walls of the city of Medina were raised so high that a camel could have gone underneath. And she said, I swear by the right of Allah if you don't release Ali now. I will make such a dua that all of you will be wiped out. They said in this condition we let Ali go. When they started to walk back, there are two conversations that happen. One is between Ali and Fatima. When Ali says to Sayyidah, are you okay? And she says, Yabna Ammi, if you are okay, then I too can be patient as well if they have abused you. The other conversation is between Imam Al-Hasan, the child and his father. Abu al-Hasan looks at his son Hassan. He says, Hassan, why do I see you weeping in the streets? He says, Baba, if you had seen what I saw, you would weep too. Amir al-Mu'mineen says, Hassan, what did you see? He says, Father, when I saw a mother coming to you and she had raised her voice to collect the people to come to your rescue, Kunfud came and struck her in the face so hard that he injured her eye. Amir al-Mu'mineen replies, this is why Fatima would not look me in the eye when I asked her if she was okay. يا الله على لعنة الله على الكوم الظالمين وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أن منقلب ينقلبون يا الله بحق فاطمة وأبيها وبعلها وبنيها وسر المستودع فيها أو الله first and foremost hasten the reappearance of صاحب الزمان أو الله make us from the supporters of صاحب الزمان أو الله forgive our sins and cover our flaws O oh Allah, there are those who are sick amongst our community, amongst our families, amongst our ummah. By dhikr of Zahra, give them shifa. O oh Allah, there are those who have come with hajat, fulfill their hajat. O oh Allah, make our children from the upright supporters of Ali Muhammad. Make our children from the supporters of the children of Zahra. Rahimallahumma yakra surah al-fatiha ma'as salawat. Fatima Zahra Fatima Zahra Fatima Zahra Fatima Zahra Ya Zahra Ya Zahra Ya Zahra Ya Zahra Ya Zahra Ya Zahra Ay meri bi bi Ay meri bi bi Tere dar pe Shahzadi ye jahan sara hai Ya Zahra Ya Zahra Ya Zahra Ya Zahra Tu hume hivz aur amad de Amni chadar ke saibad de 
तेरी कुदरत में क्या नहीं बीबी तू जिसे चाहे दो जहां दे दे